Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the organizers for setting up this conference. The actual topic of my paper was suggested by the organizers, so I focused on that, which is addressing some of the questions that have been raised about the nature of, perhaps we might use the word authentic authenticity, of crypto Judaism in New Mexico. But in talking about that, it allows me to address a broader issue, some of which was addressed by the last speaker and by other speakers, which are, one, what is the nature of authenticity and should it be a question for us? And what is the essential factor or the key factor that makes someone have a crypto-Jewish identity rather than having either the potential for a crypto-Jewish identity or perhaps um, either ancestors or uh, other DNA evidence that might suggest that a crypto-Jewish identity might be there. Now, one of the aspects that I would like to bring together, over the years we've had discussions about the nature of how one might choose what are the key elements that are constitutive of a crypto-Jewish identity or what makes a crypto-Jew. And in the past, we've had four items originally in his book. His items were slightly different than mine. And I focused on, first of all, the nature of identity. And for me, the fact that someone believes themselves to be a crypto-Jew, believes that, that that Jewish aspect of their ancestry or their, that Jewish aspect of their past, however it is constituted, is fundamental to their identity today. And for me, that is the key marker. And in the people that I've interviewed, that for them is the marker that determines whether they consider themselves a crypto Jew or not. If they have other things like practices, even belief, or even genealogy, very often if they don't have the belief that they are a crypto Jew, that self-identification, then the other elements are merely there, but not constitutive significantly of their self-understanding. So identity is fundamental, and the key aspect of the argument I'm making is that that is an internal marker rather than an external marker. In addition, um, people that I've interviewed over the years have alongside identity, very often had ranges of practices, different aspects of belief, and different ways of relating to genealogy, either through remembered ancestry of people who they associate with crypto-Judaism, patterns of endogamy, or perhaps DNA research that buttresses a crypto-Jewish identity that's pre-existing. So that's in a sense, the, the top level that I'm talking about is those people that have that identity and then have other aspects as well that tie into it. David's additional element today I think is hugely important, which is the external factor. And certainly in the case of the Inquisition, the external factor in defining who is a Jew, whether they were or weren't, was a very significant marker and very constitutive of who was a crypto Jew and who, and who wasn't in a certain respect. It also forced people to make certain stances in relation to that identity or not. So the external factor historically was very, very significant. What I'm going to suggest today is that the external factor is equally significant in a very, in, I would argue, in a negative way. That it's either academics who are saying we have a right to determine who has this identity and whether that identity is authentic, or it is different religious groups that make that same argument and say we have a right to say these people are Jews or these people are not, regardless of how these people see themselves. And we create all sorts of different models for allowing us to normalize these people, whether it is through geneal genealogical research or DNA research, as means of saying, yes, we'll allow you in if you can find the markers that we've decided are the essential markers. So that's, in a sense, the background. And David's paper really allowed me to begin you know, conceptualizing that, though that was all, always what this paper was going to be about. In touching on that, I want to draw on the work of Judith Newlander. Judith Newlander is a folklorist who has done significant amount of work in relation to crypto Judaism, particularly in New Mexico. And her conclusion was that crypto Judaism was essentially a false phenomena. It was inauthentic. And she determined the basis upon which she would make that judgment. And she had worked on two different levels. The first of those levels was what we might call meta-narratives. 
And in her PhD dissertation, which is unpublished, she raised two of these meta-narratives, and a subsequent one related to DNA has come in a couple subsequent articles. Now, the first of the meta-narratives is you know, ties in with some of the things that people have said earlier today, that crypto Jews in New Mexico purposefully or accidentally misattributed a Pentecostal or Sabbatarian origin for Jew Judaism, that they had been Seventh-day Adventists or they had been Pentecostal and had taken on Judaizing practices and that the current generation, for a variety of reasons, had forgotten or chose to forget the origin of these practices, and we're now attributing them to Judaism. Now, this is an argument that goes back to the work of Rafael Patay in Mexico, where it, it can be challenged as well. But in New Mexico, there is a very serious issue that Newlander doesn't face. And this is a, a serious methodological question. In order to make that judgment, she needs to be able to do two things. One is she needs to be able to show that both either Pentecostal or Adventist churches were prevalent in the area where the families were from. And secondly, she needs to be able to show that the families who are ex exhibiting these practices actually came from churches or that ha were Adventist or, or Pentecostal. And she does neither of those things. She has one interview in which Pentecostal religion is mentioned, but that's about it. And even there, it's only a secondary attribution within that interview. If you actually look at the prevalence of Adventist churches and, and Pentecostal churches in New Mexico from around 1940, which for me is an important date because it's, it would mean that most of the people I interviewed were in their early 20s at that time, and so that would be when they might be constructing identity. And it also is a time where there happens to be a very, very good directory produced by the New Mexico government of every church in New Mexico. And if you look at it, first of all, there were 20 Adventist churches in New Mexico, with the majority of them being in the southern part of New Mexico, and only two or three being in the north of New Mexico, and they had a total of 700 members. So we're talking a very small population. There were additionally two other um, Adventist groups, which had very few churches, each with a total of 350 members. So we're talking about 1,400 people with Adventist backgrounds. If we go to Pentecostal churches, there were four different Pentecostal churches groupings in New Mexico at that time, with all of the churches in southern New Mexico. And they had a total of 750 members altogether. I mean, sorry, for each one of those individual groupings. So again, less than 3,000. So we're talking about, within the popul Hispanic population in New Mexico, a very, very small set of people that could have this false Adventist or, uh, or, or um, Pentecostal tr tradition. And they're all pretty much in the wrong places. So almost all of those churches are in southern New Mexico with a few in Albuquerque and almost none in the northern part of New Mexico where there is a, 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 the prevalence of people interviewed expressing crypto-Jewish identity are from. Most of the people that converted to out of Catholicism went to Presbyterian traditions, none of which have any Judaizing practices, so you can't attribute Jewish practices to those particular groups. Then if you actually look at the families that I interviewed that express crypto-Jewish identity, in almost none of the cases were they not Catholic in their public manifestation of faith. There was no evidence except in one or two cases of families who had been either Adventist or Pentecostal. And in the one case where, where people said, yes, we were Adventist, they said two things. One is they suggested that they knew that they, were that they were Adventist and they knew that some of the things they did were Adventist, but they also said, well, our grandfather chose to be an Adventist because it allowed him to do certain practices that he couldn't do as a Catholic. And what Newlander misses is that we have to both address why people might choose a particular faith to convert from Catholicism from, and 
whether those people actually did convert to that faith. So in terms of this general meta-narrative of a false view of Pentecostal or um, Seventh-day Adventist ideology becoming Jewish ideology, there is no good historical data to back it up. And you can add to that the practices that she attributes to either Adventism or Pentecostalism, there's no good evidence that those practices were done within those traditions. For example, um, allowing blood to be spilled on the ground. There's no evidence that Pentecostals or Adventists in New Mexico did that. She's just attributing it to it because she needs to find a way of saying these people are inauthentic as Jews, therefore we have to attribute their Jewish practices to something else. The second meta-narrative that um, Newlander raises, and it's one that we've heard today a little bit, is that of what she calls the cultural pathology of racial whitening. And this is the argument that crypto-Jews did not want to be mestizo, and therefore they want to claim that they're pure Spanish, and the way of doing that is to be able to claim we're pure Jewish. Now, there's a couple aspects of that particular approach that need to be addressed. First of all, we have to ask, why did they choose to choose to use Jewish ancestors among the colonists that came to New Mexico to, to claim this racial whitening, when they could equally well have chosen Spanish? And many other people do use Spanish ancestors and claim close association with the early Spanish colonialists. Um, colonists. So that's one question that one needs to address. Secondly, is a claim of Judaism in New Mexico actually moving up status? And given the stories of anti-Semitism that many of the, my informants mentioned when they publicly claimed to be Jewish, it doesn't seem to hold very good water that that, in that particular approach. So that also doesn't work. But it misses a, a second and a third and more important area, which is it's attributing motivations to people without actually having those people say that those are their motivations themselves. If you actually look at the data, and Janet Jacobs in her book, and I also address this issue very particularly, when we asked most of our respondents how they constructed their ancestry, most of them said that they were mestizo in origin. They said, we have you know, all Native Americans, we have African Americans, we have Spaniards, we have Jews, we have a whole range of aspects that make up our, our background. Almost none of them made the claim of pure crypto-Jewish identity or background. So in that sense, the, we also don't find data that supports Newlander's contention. But the key issue for me in both of these approaches is that these are theories that are untested, either looking at historical data, or they are theories that impute motivations to people without actually having good data to say whether those motivations are true or not. The third, one of her, her, the third area of her analysis is an article that makes the claim that because the DNA profile of New Mexico is the same as the DNA profile of Spain, therefore um, crypto-Jews aren't prevalent in New Mexico. It misses the point, which is that if you look at the DNA profile of Spain, as we heard earlier, it has a significant factor of people of Jewish descent, 10%. And if that's the same in New Mexico, then that again gives a significant area for people who have a potential to make this claim. And, we, and you can't say, therefore, there are no crypto-Jews in New Mexico, therefore, the hypotheses about crypto-Judaism in New Mexico are wrong. So Newlander also, in that particular article, does not make her case. So the main arguments that she makes are not supported. She makes a subsidiary argument, which is the false identification of practices as being crypto-Judaic by false analogy. And here, she is making a good argument. There are certain practices that outside scholars have determined are Jewish practices because they want to see them as Jewish practices. But that is, in spite of the fact that that is sometimes true, she tries to overgeneralize it in every single area and miss the fact that there are other professional ethnographers and folklorists who have done work in New Mexico and among other crypto Jews and not made that false identification, but allow people to make that identification for themselves. Again, she misses the point that 
The origin of a practice is not the significant aspect. It's the way the people who use the practice interpret it and give it value. If they interpret that practice as being a practice that is constitutive of their Jewish identity, then that's what it is even if its origin was in a non-Jewish practice. Just like the fact that if you have a practice that originally was a Jewish practice, but today is done for other reasons, it's no longer a Jewish practice by the people who use it. Eating bagels and lox on the weekend is not a Jewish practice. A lot of Americans do it. It's not constitutive of a Jewish identity, even if it started within that particular community. So let me pull this back together because I want to come back to the general issue of authenticity. One of the key features of Newlander's arguments and the other arguments about crypto-Judaism in New Mexico are external scholars saying, we have the right to determine, regardless of ethnography, regardless of the way people see themselves, what the value of a community's identity is. And we have the right to say, no, you are, or no, you aren't, or yes, you are. And she, in fact, says this. She says, if you can show me a diary from the 16th, 17th, 18th century that says, these are crypto Jews, and you can show it to me, then I'll accept it. What's her right to accept it? She should be making a scholarly argument that's open to be challenged by other scholars, but not saying, I have a right to determine people's identities or not. And I think that that's a key issue. And if we look at a whole range of other scholarship that relates to crypto-Judaism, what it does is it attacks the scholars who are making arguments about crypto-Judaism. It says, well, they're not proper ethnographers or they're not proper folklorists, therefore they're making all sorts of mistakes. Or if you look at Michael Carroll, he says that all of the people studying crypto-Judaism in New Mexico are Orientalists and trying to you know, um, impose the Orientalist paradigm on an exoticized New Mexico, and it's the scholars who are wrong. There, you have a whole argument which says, well, we, we don't really care about what the people say about themselves. If we can show that the scholarship and the scholars are wrong, then the people must be wrong. And I think it's essential for us to recognize and to take seriously the internal identity and the way people view themselves. Equally, issues like DNA, issues like genealogy, can only be secondary. You can have all the DNA evidence of Jewish ancestry that you like. DNA doesn't carry culture. It doesn't carry value, which is your last point. Even genealogy doesn't carry culture. It provides a way of demonstrating that if someone happens to have though that identity is making that argument about themselves, then if they need to, because someone wants to demand to them, you need to prove to me that that identity is right, okay, then maybe DNA and maybe genealogy have a place in that kind of argument. But again, it's devaluing the nature of people's own self-understanding. And I'd want to come back to something that Tudor Parfit was saying earlier, which sort of was making a distinction between communities that we can authentically say are Jewish and other communities that they have all this identity and self-understanding, but we don't authentically say are Jewish because we can't find the DNA, we can't find the historical connection. I'd like to suggest that we need to move away from the kinds of paradigms that give us the right whether it's a religious right or an identity right or whatever, our, whatever basis we want to say it's from, to say, no, that identity is inauthentic and, we're go and we have a right to make that judgment. Thank you. <laughs>